Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for joining. Um, and I'd like to really thank the speakers. Um, and, and actually, these are not just speakers, these are the people that have also provided really impressive editorials and, and viewpoints that are coming out slowly and some of them are already out in JMCC+. Um, the, the topic today is reproducibility and reporting of negative results uh, in cardiovascular research, obviously. And, um, and, and we think this is a topic that's really, really important, needs to be addressed probably several times over. And there are lots of moves to, to address this topic. And I guess this is just um, uh, our, our attempt to do so as well uh, at JMCC and JMCC Plus and as part of the ISHR effort. Um, the speakers are really impressive. Uh, we we have uh, Professor Yolanda van der Velden um, from uh, University of Amsterdam, uh, Professor David Eisner from University of Manchester, uh, Dr. Ronald Lugnosi from University of Colorado, uh, Professor Thomas Eschenhagen from University of Hamburg, and Professor Rong Tian from University of Washington. Uh, the, the order of events will be today, today will be as such. We will uh, have a few introductions first. Uh, first, we'll start with Professor David Eisner, who will give a bit of an overview of the topic. Uh, and then we will move on to two further talks, very short talks, um, I, I believe about five minutes or so, by uh, Professor Yolanda Valden Velden, uh, uh, who will discuss uh, the topic of reproducibility and reporting of negative data from the perspective of a professorial um, um, level, uh, career level. And uh, then Dr. Ron Vagnosi will, will sort of give his views uh, from the perspective of early career, even though I mean, he's he's moved on to definitely mid-career uh, at least, but uh, he felt that that was uh, probably the perspective he could he could sort of best represent. Uh, and uh, then we will actually open the floor to questions from you, but equally we have some questions which are going to be posted in the chat uh, for all of you to see so that you can see these are just some of the things that we think should be discussed. But please feel free to send your further questions via either the Q&A box or via the chat box at any point in time. So I will stop sharing now. And uh, David, um, do you mind taking the floor and uh, giving us your overview? Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? So, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to set the scene by talking about the need to publish negative data but by introducing to you, if you don't know about it already, the so-called reproducibility crisis. So perhaps one disclaimer at the beginning, I think it would be naive to think that science can be 100% reproducible. After all, science is carried out by human beings who will err. And it's also, I think, inevitable that much of many of the experiments we do, there may be problems with them that can then be refined by future work. But I think there's a growing awareness today in the context of the reproducibility science that science that's carried out badly damages reproducibility. What do I mean by bad science? Well, it covers a multitude of things, one of which is fraud, deliberate fraud. And there are many recent examples of deliberate fraud. And I think this is perhaps one of them here. There are also the problem of uncontrolled experimental factors, things that influence the data we get, the experiments we do, but which we're not aware of at the time that we do the experiments. <clears throat> Those of us who work on cell lines, it's now widely appreciated that these cell lines can get contaminated. They can be phenotypically altered. The, the cell lines can, can change their properties with passage, or quite simply, there have been cases where cell lines are incorrectly labeled. There was a, a case where there was confusion, was a cell line a breast cancer cell line or an ovarian cancer cell line? And, and many publications were done with these cell lines being confused. It's no better if you work on animals. <clears throat> it, we now realize that the strain of an animal can be every bit as important as the species. So. It's no, not good enough just to say one's working on mice. There are all sorts of strains of mice. And this was less appreciated in the past. 
the environment in which a mouse, the animals are kept in the animal house also have large effects. In particular, we know the importance today of the light-dark cycle for entraining circadian rhythms. And this was less well appreciated in the past. And quite simply, the diet on which animals are fed can have big effects on how the uh, organs of the animal, including the heart, behave. Another factor that affects things is poor design and or statistical <coughs> analysis. So today, I hope everybody's aware of the need to blind the experimenter as much as possible to the tissues they're working on and also to randomize things. So let's imagine one's doing a study on heart failure on mice. One should randomly take the mice out of the animal house and randomly split them into control or heart failure limbs. This is appreciated today, although I don't think it's always done, but it was much less um, understood the need for it in the past. As far as statistics are concerned, there's all sorts of, of problems, and we might talk about some of them later. What I'm particularly concerned about is what the P, too much dependence on p-values, what I call the 0.05 fallacy. So by convention, if the p-value is less than 0.05, things are considered significant. If it's greater, they're not significant. And that can end up with the ridiculous idea that, for example, if p is 0.049, it's significant, but if P is 0.051, it's not significant. And more and more journals these days are demanding that authors quote exact p-values just to get around this problem. By data torturing, what I mean is analyzing the data in as many ways as possible until you get a significant value. This is going to lead to a lack of reproducibility and um, equally, trying every statistical test until you get something which is statistically significant. So these are but two examples of bad use of statistics. What I want to draw attention to for a moment is that I think this is a spectrum of things. I mean, fraud obviously is very, very bad. You go through this and you end up with poor design of statistical analysis. And I think there's a tendency to think that perhaps fraud is very much worse than the others, but I'm not sure how, how reasonable an attitude that is. After all, if you're these days, if you're using the wrong statistics, despite the fact that people know it's the wrong statistics, is this actually qualitatively different from deliberate fraud? And again, we might come back to this. Another point I want to make is that I, I believe that it's the system that encourages bad science. We all operate in in the, the academic system. And I think that if we want to stamp out bad science, we ought to look at the way the system behaves. And one particular problem is that the system incentivizes um, people publishing papers, publishing quickly. And also there are various other incentives, one of which are quite simply cash incentives. This little article in Science talks about the fact that in some countries, people are given cash bonuses if they publish in top journals. Now, the article was written about what goes on in China, but as you'll see from this um, graphic here, then in many other countries, people are given cash bonuses, which in some cases can be tens of thousands of dollars for getting published in the top journals. And if we're given enough money, I think many of us, it may reset our moral compasses and determine whether we're likely to cut corners in order to publish. But it's not just cash bonuses that change the way people behave. There are all sorts of other impact incentives, one of which is the impact factor. I think these days there's a lot of credit given to people if they publish in so-called top journals. And this didn't used to be the, the case when I entered science. You might say, well, does that matter if we give people more credit for publishing, let's say, in Nature or Cell? Well, if you're not worried already, you might be if you look at this graph. This graph is actually done for the field of immunology, infection and immunity, but I'm sure the same thing would apply to the heart. What have we got here? This is the impact factor going from naught up to 80. 
And this is the retraction index. Now, the retraction index is proportional to the percentage of papers in that journal which are retracted largely on grounds of fraud. What I want you to notice is how beautiful this linear correlation is. That is to say, those journals that have the highest impact factors also have the highest percentage of papers retracted. Those journals with the lowest impact factors have the lowest percentage of papers retracted. And I think probably what this means is that in order to get published in the top journals, people are more likely to carry out bad science. After all, if you're going to corrupt yourself and carry out bad science, perhaps you might as well do it in order to get published in these journals rather than in these journals. And to do it, to get published there, I think what it means is that people will cheat, they'll commit fraud, and they will use dodgy statistics and all the things that I presented to you a couple of slides ago. So to sum up the influence of the academic environment on science, I think that bad science you can think of as perhaps a successful gamble. Definitely in the short term, if people carry out bad science, they may get cash bonuses. If the bad science allows them to publish in the best, so-called best journals, they may get more kudos. And as a result of this, they may get their first job and they may get promoted. All of this, I think, is definite. It may be that they get found out and get exposed and disgraced. But even people who've been found out for committing fraud maintain in many institutions their high profile positions. So to um, to perhaps to stimulate discussion, I think that if we want to get rid, improve reproducibility, we need to change the system so that it rewards reproducibility as opposed to currently rewarding bad science. So this I've talked about already, the cause of the lack of reproducibility. I want to end by coming back to the subject of this webinar by pointing out what I haven't talked about already, which is publication bias, which at the moment is that if you get positive results, these get published and get you credit. If you get negative results, they get less likely to get published. Well, why is that? So imagine uh, th this is a completely artificial example. We want to study, does snake oil cure heart failure? And I went to the internet and here's a nice picture that snake oil cures everything. So imagine we set out to study snake oil on heart failure. And let's imagine this is studied by 10 laboratories worldwide. 10 laboratories investigate it. Nine of them find no effect. And therefore, what happens then? Well, if they find no effect, well, probably most of these labs will decide it's not worth publishing. And if they do submit it, they do submit it to the top journals, the journals won't be interested in publishing it. But there may be one laboratory that finds an effect of snake oil. And this may just be by statistical chance. They haven't done anything wrong. But if you study, if enough labs study it, then just by chance, one of them will find an effect. So they submit this to the top journals. And the snake oil, because it's a positive effect, it will get published. And as far as the world is concerned, snake oil cures heart failure because the nine studies that haven't found an effect nobody knows about, or if they are published, they're buried somewhere in the literature. It's the one positive effect which is published. And we all know now that snake oil cures heart failure. So to sum up then, I think for that reason, it's important that negative data gets published. I think it's also equally important that confirmatory positive data gets published. So if somebody has published a paper, showing an effect, then as it's important that things that disagree with that get published, but it's also equally important that data that agrees with it gets published so that the scientific community knows what the balance of evidence is. That's all I want to say. If anybody's interested in anything further, I published the first part in the Journal of Molecular and Cellular Cardiology, and very recently in Davos' new journal, JMCC Plus, talked about positive aspects of negative data. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. This was really impressive uh, and concerning and thought provoking. <laughs> Yolanda, I think.
I right. will move on, right? Do you see okay, my screen? Thank you. Yes. Cool. Okay, yeah, thanks uh, for the great initiative. And, and David, you always give a wonderful introduction. <laughs> I loved your paper years ago, and uh, I'm happy to just share uh, some briefly some views from a yeah, sort of a mentor supervisor view where I think we we may hopefully change uh, the, the scientific world. And, and I, I also sort of kick off with like, yeah, what, what's the, the world around us? How does it affect our publication? Uh, yeah, behavior sort of um, cash incentives and also the this really clearly shows the publication bias why right? that clearly there is much more positive results obtained in science than negative results or or the or the other way like the, the snake or it's just not uh, submitted or not published at all so one thing I think we really have to change as a supervisor mentor is is really try to tell everyone that it's, yeah, what's that negative sounds very negative, right? Because it's actually very positive. So if you actually have a carefully designed study with an hypothesis, either uh, yeah, having a yes or no at the end should be fine. So we should really view negative data. Maybe we should think of another word <laughs> and just uh, make it more positive. Uh, so we get away with also publishing uh, data which do not uh, or with do not confirm the initial uh, hypothesis. So I think uh, that's a thing we might discuss. Maybe we can have a call and, and have people think about a new term. Another thing I would like to highlight that maybe to avoid uh, yeah, not publishing uh, the studies in animals, David nicely pointed out all the hurdles which are out there. We are more aware about uh, of, of the strain effects of the environment, the diet, that uh, there's now the initiative to pre-register also the animal studies, which is normal in clinical studies. I would like to also discuss this with everyone who's listening. Do we think this is a valid point? Is it the way to go? I think it, it's very good. It's, uh, I must say we didn't do it ourselves in Amsterdam yet, so I think we should definitely start. But it's an initiative really, uh, and I, I got these slides from Julia Menon, who uh, is, is really very, open to addressing questions if you have them. Um, so it's really to, to have more, to be more uh, open uh, about the, the animal studies, hopefully to prevent uh, the, the failure of translating findings in, in mouse studies to, to the clinical setting. Um, uh, and and uh, maybe also to, to increase reproducibility of data, but just overall be more open and, and publish your, um, yeah. Uh, your your plans for your clinic or for your studies in in the mouse or rat or any other animal. Um, so this is sort of just an overview, um, uh, just to highlight. Uh, you, it's just available this platform for everyone. Uh, it's it's supposed to be, to be very fast and easy to enter uh, your study. Uh, if you change your, your methods, you can easily change it. All data are secure, it's anonymous. You can also have an embargo on your study, so you don't have to give away all your new IDs, et cetera. And, uh, and if you have questions, uh, you can just uh, contact uh, the people in charge of this registry and they will help you. Uh, so just to, to show some numbers and the website, uh, so there's an increased number uh, in the past years of, of registered studies. And yeah, again, I think it, it may be really uh, good to think about this. It will sharpen your idea also at the start of your uh, experiment, uh, yeah, having a good study design. So just, and then reproducibility, I'll, I'll go swiftly through it. Uh, so what can you do yourself? I always tell the people around me, don't be sloppy, right? It's often <laughs> the case, uh, which also introduces a lot of uh, reproducibility problems. <laughs> uh, secondly, I'm a big uh, fan of, of proper sample collection because for sure rubbish in is rubbish out. And I'm a big fan of Crystals from Medias, uh, my long-term collaborator in Sydney who started biobanking samples a long time ago in a very careful way. And this shows just the, 
the picture of all the people who were able to to work on these samples, which were very well collected, and this this really ended up in this contributed immensely to our scientific advances. And I think we should there, there's also biobanking of stem cells, of course, but I think that still also there we could do better in biobanking also from animal studies. And, and and sharing samples to to uh, yeah to check if we can reproduce uh, uh, studies. So we one brief example is that we also did this in an EU funded project where we focused on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And one thing to also uh, just do yourself to see if you uh, can trust your data is just to use the same sample in different places. And, and in this case, we did it together with a group in, uh, in Florence. We measure kinetics of myofibrils. I won't go into the details, but in the same tissues, we measure like uh, using the system in Amsterdam, uh, ATP consumption relative to, to function. And the fun thing is that basically using different systems, we end up with similar uh, yeah, outcomes like like uh, there is an increased kinetics, uh, which highly correlates with the energy consumption, which is at the level of the myosinets. But it's it's nice that you use different systems, but and build uh, uh, same or basically they come to the same conclusion. So I think that's an easy way for younger people to find collaborators. And I know Thomas Eschenagen, uh, who's also here. Uh, was highly involved in IPS studies, right? Using different systems and also testing compounds and see how those different systems compare. So I think that's a, 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 something which the, the junior scientists could also organize themselves uh, in their own project. So team up, that's my last uh, <laughs> message to the, to the field. And then I'm happy to give the word to, uh, to Ron. Thank you, Yolanda. I managed to stop here. <laughs> yeah. And and finally, for our final talk, Ronald Vignozzi will uh, give us a a perspective from a I guess an early career, possibly to a mid career now <laughs> researcher, um, on on this particular topic. Thank you, Davor. I would also like to thank Davor and Rong for putting together this really fantastic initiative and. I just have one slide. And what I thought I would do, because I think a lot of the points that were raised just now apply to early career. So what I thought I'd do is I would highlight what I think is the, the major challenge of the early career stage and that it's very broad, meaning, you know, and I'm using the ISHR's sort of definition of early career, but I know there might be some others that are different. But as I see it, early careers can be junior PIs or group leaders, Early careers can be trainees. They can be pre-doctoral students, postdoctoral students. So, so I thought what I would just briefly do is highlight what I see as some of the unique challenges and maybe some good news at the very end about um, how, in my opinion, us in the early career stage should think about some of these challenges. Um, so starting with the group leader or PI, so I opened my lab about two years ago now, um, and I've learned a lot in a short time about how to build a sort of lab culture of reproducible science. And um, a lot of that was learning on the fly. And I think if, you know, initiatives like this really help, but in general, uh, you know, the, the, there we go. The, the early ECI PI often doesn't have a lot of, you know, resources to think about how to create their own lab structure and culture of reproducibility. And so some of the things I highlighted here are challenges for all researchers, but I think ECIs can be particularly vulnerable to this publish or perish mentality. Uh, we're under pressure to produce, we're under pressure to you know, publish papers, often high impact papers that can impact our career progression. And so ECIs can be particularly vulnerable to some of the, the biases that were highlighted by, by Dr. Eisner and Dr. Vandervelde. Um, another thing that ECIs I think can struggle with is that there might be less willingness for a, a junior person to go against the established dogma. And so I think the analogy of the, you know, the snake oil curing heart failure is, is a good one because once something becomes established in the field, even if it's particularly not rigorous, it's often more challenging to refute it. And it can be particularly challenging for a new person to, to kind of come out and say, well, I didn't or wasn't able to reproduce this. And so I think, you know, ECI's, 
have a particular need for uh, resources to help them promote um, science that is perhaps a non-reproducibility study. And I think, again, initiatives like this are really helpful. Um, and then, you know, what, what I found in my few first years of running my group is that there are often a variety of strategies for developing uh, effective reproducibility standards, but they can vary. And, and so, for example, at my university, we have a subscription to online um, laboratory notebooks. We have a lot of resources uh, to help us record data properly and share data, uh, but this can vary. Uh, and, and some universities might not be uh, having these resources available yet. Uh, so I think those are some of the challenges that are somewhat unique to the early uh, ECI as a group leader. Um, there's also, you know, a particular challenge for the trainees. And I think ECI says trainees face a lot of difficulty because, again, that there, there can be a perception that a non-significant result or an inconsistent result is a failed experiment. Um, you know, in my group, we've taken sort of the approach of really, you know, praising and, and being happy about experiments that don't always show the result we like, because that tells us we, you know, we've done something rigorous and, and, and consistent, and this is the result. And, and we treat that just as much of a, a success as an experiment that has a striking phenotype. Uh, another thing that I found is that when I was a trainee is that it can take time to develop a critical instinct with which, with which to assess the literature. And so, you know, again, the papers that are perhaps not as rigorous, the papers that come that eventually get retracted on the surface in those initial years, they can often look quite promising. They can be in high impact journals and, and a lot of people will jump onto those results and get really excited by them. And so for a trainee, it can be really challenging to, to look at something with a broad perspective and this takes time. And so we need to encourage our trainees to develop critical instincts. We need, we need to help them uh, learn how to review papers and look for some of these, these indices of, of, of rigor uh, really right off the bat. Uh, and again, there can be pressure to produce the right results. And this is where the mentor has a really important role in, in helping the trainee realize that, that again, the right result is the, is the result that's done well and the, the result that is uh, scientifically valid, not necessarily the high impact result. Uh, so I, I think I just want to highlight some good news in, in my opinion. I think ECIs also have a unique opportunity to start off strong and develop some good habits from the beginning. And again, I think this is where programs like the webinar we're doing today and, and the special issue can really help highlight uh, what rigorous science should look like uh, and, and get especially our trainees started off on the right path. Um, and I also think that you know, this is perhaps not always the case. ECIs can be often well engaged with newer technology and newer systems for data storage. And I, I've learned quite a few in my, my first couple of years that my, my trainees had to guide me through because even, even for me, they were not as user friendly as I would have liked, but now, um, you know, I'm, I've become more flexible, and I found that there's a lot of programs that are really helpful for this. And so I think ECIs can really take advantage of these new resources. So I just want to leave it with a bit of encouragement. Uh, and I'd also like to think to ask anyone in the in the audience when they pose a, a question or a chat, if if you are in this ECI category, let us know because I'd, I'd be curious to see what the representation is. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, turn it over. Thank you, Ron. This is really, really useful and very interesting. Uh, I think hopefully it'll kick off the discussions really well. I, I think, you know, when I was at least thinking about this, a uh, question of publishing negative data and reproducibility studies is really, really different from the perspectives of, let's say, when you're a professor, when obviously you don't benefit that much from a, a maybe a lesser impact factor study or a smaller study. Um, as opposed to maybe an early career researcher or a, or a mid-career researcher even, but certainly an early career researcher. You know, publications are are useful. I, I always think that it's great to have lots of publications, even if they're not high impact, uh, but probably your professor may feel differently about this and actually may push you to put that data set towards a bigger publication, which may take years and therefore doesn't serve you particularly well. So I feel like there's a disconnect between the requirements almost <laughs> between different career stages. But I think we can discuss this uh, at length now, probably. Um, and so shall we now move on to the questions? Wrong. Would you would you like to maybe start um, with the first Q&A? Because I think we've got some Q&A uh, questions. 
and and then I'll maybe go on to uh, the chat questions that we've got. Yeah, that that sounds like a good idea. And uh, so, first of all, I, I I'm really excited to have this webinar and the, and the excellent panel uh, for for the discussion. I think this is a much needed uh, discussion for for this very important topic, and it's also wonderful that IACHR as our professional society is committed to address this issue. And so the GMCC and GMCC Plus are both journals of IACHR and we are uh, providing the platform for the discussion and also uh, probably push forward in, in this uh, important area. So we do want to not only receive questions from audience but also suggestions on how to go forward. Uh, okay wrong sorry i just i just thought considering you've just said that i'm just going to put this up that, that just yeah. remind you there is a call for the open um uh, open call for the reproducibility studies as well as reporting of negative data in jmcc plus it's an open call it will run forever hopefully so if you do have studies like this uh then please do send them in uh we don't require um uh, what we require is rigorous um, science, rigorous uh, approach to science, but actually the result actually doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, we're willing to, and certainly reproducibility studies are also welcome if you have them reproduced in different systems, different animal models, different cellular types, uh, please do send them in. We are interested in publishing this. I'll stop sharing now. And sorry, Ronk, I jumped in, but I thought I thought it was the right time to jump mm. in. Yeah, perfect, uh, Davor. Uh, so, so we go uh, in the in the Q and A uh, box, and the, you can also enter your comments or questions in the chat box. And so, Devo and I will each take care of one box. So, we go with the Q and A. The first question comes from an anonymous attendee, and the question is, "What is your view?" Um, the grant uh, review committee requires certain number of publications before I award you the grant, and the uh, Graduation, uh, graduation thesis committee, graduate thesis committee requires a certain number of publications to give you the degree. And um, so there's a lot of pressure to produce. So how do you balance this? I, that's my interpretation of the question. Anyone in the panel have any thoughts? Can I, uh, I can kick off? to answer or to, to respond to that. I think there's, I think, a difference between county, countries, that's one, and particularly if you think about the PhD requirement. So that's, um, so it would be interesting to know where this person comes from. The Netherlands is quite strict. They, we, we really ask for PhD quite uh, a lot of um, manuscripts and published data, although the landscape, at least in the Netherlands, is changing. To be uh, yeah less on on age index impact factors and more on on the science so there is a changing landscape at least um, and also on committees it's it's so I do think uh, it's changing I, I it's it's to me it also relates a bit to to what Dapo said that it may depend on career stage if you want to publish and and if high impact or or just have publications. I think that's it's you I hope younger junior people also can think of that and and their senior advice is should be sustainable right and that's sort of linking to what David said like yeah you can have high impact but if it ends up to a dead end then then that's also the end of a research line so that's something which you should also take into consideration if yeah. you are a junior scientist because what do you build on it's a difficult question. I, somehow, I always had an ambivalent um, feeling to this, for me, Dutch rule with the many publications. Overall, I think it's wrong, honestly. I think it's wrong. It's, um, it's training people from the beginning to have a very, very result-oriented, many impact factor, um, result-oriented thinking, which I believe is dangerous. On the other hand, this said, I also don't like that in, for example, in my faculty, you can make a PhD without anything. And that's obviously a very bad start for a career. So somehow the system, I think there is no perfect solution. 
So but but I, I'm happy you say that, uh, Thomas, because I think it's it's I think that the idea in the Netherlands at least is that, that you will you have the entire process. So you also learn how to write, you learn how to rebuttal, but that can be with one very good study. <laughs> so rather than having like a multiple a paper. So they yeah. it, yeah. maybe you have something to yeah, to uh, add. In the UK, we don't have a requirement for publications to get a PhD, but I take Thomas's point as well. Address it, the, the question that also asks about grants. I mean, I think it's perfectly reasonable that before giving someone a grant, you know that they have produced science in the past, because that's one of the things you want to judge, their ability to do science. But I think it would be silly to demand a certain number of publications. You just want evidence evidence that they can they are likely to be able to do the work yeah um, yeah any any other thoughts on this um, i mean wrong my, my if i may just jump in i guess my feeling on this is that i i do understand that you need to have evidence of being able to do something in order to get a grant to do it uh, and i think that to me is perfectly reasonable i don't think you need to have publications necessarily in order to get a PhD, particularly if, you know, you're waiting to write up a bigger paper, like, like I sort of mentioned earlier, and your data is going towards that. And, you know, your supervisor is saying, well, we're not going to publish this smaller study. We're going to wait for it to kind of contribute to a bigger data set um, and therefore a bigger impact factor. I, I sort of understand that as well. And therefore in UK, I feel the system is fine because you know, you if you've done something and actually still not published yet, it still means you can pass your PhD. Um, but of course, that still puts you in a difficult position for applying for any fellowships or even demonstrating to somebody who is going to give you a postdoc um, that you can do certain things. So, yeah. so th there, there is a conflict between the two. Now, hopefully, with the ability to publish smaller negative data sets, uh, perhaps that are well done, maybe that you know, is a way to to kind of address both issues to an extent, um, but that's my kind of hope. Um, uh, yeah, Ron. Yeah, I I total I completely agree. I guess what I'm wondering about and thinking about is, you know, how does someone who's finishing their PhD show productivity without a publication? So, for example. I would be curious to know the folks that, that sit on these committees about preprints. And so would, would a PhD student who has a preprint be acceptable to finish their thesis defense, but maybe not um, publish the paper until later? And the other thing that I think is challenging is that, you know, students who have a large number of unfinished projects who want to move on, you know, it becomes a difficult nature to try to, try to see where, where those projects are going to get eventually finished. And then there's the issue of, of authorship credit and all that. And so I, I, I agree. I don't know that there should be a number associated with, you know, finishing your PhD, but I I, I, I think there needs to be some sort of metric of, of what that project produced, even if it's not a publication. So would, would a preprint be a solution for this? Mm. Uh, good point. And so, so one thing I, I want to clarify here is uh, like uh, we we are uh, talking about uh, not rush to publish uh, uh, because you want to find drastic differences or to make a high impact paper. So we are advocating for well designed experiment. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have productivity, and uh, it just takes years and years to figure out how to design the experiment. So you never have publication. That's not what what we're saying, we're saying is that you should start with a well-designed experiment. And whether your experiment says yes or no to hypothesis, and it will be valuable. Um, yes, but I think you have to accept that doing it properly is much slower. If you, if you, for example, if you do the statistics properly and require more animals, it's much slower and much more expensive. So unless you protect that, attitude, those people are going to get competed out by the people who do it quickly. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. And so, uh, so we, uh, 
So we, we first say that if it's, uh, we're promoting that everything should be done with the adequate experimental design. So we shouldn't give an advantage to those who got a drastic contrast results. Right. Can I, wrong, just to kind of speed up the discussions, should we move on uh -huh. to the next question, do you think? Yes, yes. And I, it looks like we have a number of questions coming up. So so the um, the, the next one is from Rudolf uh, Fishmaster. Uh, hi, Rudolf. And the, uh, so the, the suggestion is about uh, deposit the data in the public domain. And so a number of journals are now uh, uh, requesting for that. Is that a, a way to go for the future? So that will prevent um, biased uh, conclusions. I think so. Yeah. In principle, I, I can tell you an example. I got a paper recently. It was a meta-analysis of single nuclear sequencing data. And they took the entirety of, I don't know what it was, atherosclerosis, I think. And the data mainly fitted except two papers. And this author asked us not to ask uh, these two authors um, of the other papers, which didn't fit, as reviewers. And I was wondering, OK, what does this mean? <laughs> so I mean, in a way, you could say this meta-analysis cleans mm -hmm. up the field. Because if, let's say, 80% fit and 20 are really outliers, it somehow argues that something was wrong with these two papers. I don't know. So in, in principle, yeah, I think this is an interesting concept. It, I like it. I mean, it's sort of like uh, it's an open discussion. I agree that, that we should share the data, as I, I also think it's yeah. good to, to start uh, submitting your, your animal studies to pre to registration. Um, I think yeah, I also like, that's a I very like good that idea that you, you ask the people to, to respond to their own study and why it may be deviating from yeah the rest. Actually, yeah. but in this case, he excluded them. Oh, yeah, he excluded them. Because apparently he did not want oh, to discuss okay. with them about this. Oh, okay, I thought you said he, he, he asked them. Okay, it would have been nice to ask them, actually. <laughs> I mean, going <laughs> to back open to... open up the discussion. I mean, going back to Rodolphe's question, I think it is very good to deposit the data, but I don't think it'll deal with the fraudsters. I think the clever fraudster will just deposit cleverly obtained fraudulent data, but all the other addresses issues will be addressed. Yeah, I, I, I believe so as well. It's not a solution for everybody, but it's, it's a step forward. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'll, I'll just jump in. I don't know if you've seen, but eLife is actually changing their publication system, whereby now they will publish anything that get, lands in their inbox, pretty much, uh, and then they will separately publish the reviews that follow. Uh, and and then you can choose to address the reviewers' comments, and that goes onto a separate DOI. Um, so so it's an iterative process, which is live effectively, uh, which some people aren't happy about. But you know that that may be another way of addressing some of these issues, where reviewers don't allow you to publish essentially negative data. <laughs> but uh, okay. Uh, a good discussion on this one, and we move to the next. Uh, so the next uh, question is from an anonymous attendee, and it's about uh, sometimes the negative data is about you're trying to make something work. You try and you try again, so you actually accumulated a lot of uh, this doesn't work, that doesn't work experience. Is that worth publishing? And so others know and, uh, those are the caveats. Yes, I think, I think what you're saying is that if you get a negative result, all you can say is that if there is an effect, it must be smaller than a certain size. And for some scientific questions, that's a useful thing for people to know. So I agree. Yeah, I think it isn't the example you give quite something we are looking for here in this um, series? Exactly that. I mean, you try to, let's say, reproduce something. You did this and that, and you varied here and there, but you just couldn't get it. That would be great for me as information. 
it doesn't necessarily okay. exclude the original data, but it, or negate them. But it's 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 a good evi or strong evidence that maybe the initial message wasn't completely correct. But I'm not sure whether the question is Thomas is talking about that way. Is not you can't confirm, you can't reproduce the previous experiment as opposed to simply doing an experiment which gives a negative result, finds no effect. Yeah, it sounds like methodological troubleshooting or something, which you, yeah. I think that's nice. I mean, if you have sort of a, They're both. Uh, it would be sort of a yeah. methods paper where you do a lot of troubleshooting and still you didn't have the optimized protocol maybe, <laughs> or not, not. I think that's very important to share. And I definitely think that's fitting, yeah. But I think it also raises the question of, you know, obviously proving a negative is very difficult. And so it raises the point of, of at what at what level can you say, well, this I've tried as best as I can to reproduce the conditions of another project or another lab, and we don't see that result. But again, you know, at what point can you definitively or as close to definitively as possible say this is this is a negative result? So never. I, I find that never. Never, Popper, yeah. Blue Swain. <laughs> you can simply never say that there is no Blue Swain because it could be, you can just only say, as you said, I looked a thousand times and never saw one. That's it. But it, that's good. I think that's the basic of science. And if you looked a thousand times and others looked five times and found it, and well, I mean, that's something to discuss about then. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I want to add here that this type of paper that JMCC Plus is interested to, to uh, look, uh, but we also want to make very clear that if you try things, it doesn't work. You got to lay out your method of trying very clearly so we can see how you tried. Uh, if there's a clear flaw in it, uh, then, then we'll point it out. And uh, so, so like a very, very rigorous method is important. Yeah, and and actually, wrong. Do you mind if I just move on to the second next question by Charles Chung and Q and A? Then yeah, yeah, take it away. Which, which I think builds on this quite well. I mean, Charles, first of all, how Charles uh, is saying that Dr. Eisner mentioned the design of experiments uh, and his in his experience, review and planning of experiments requires understanding of confidence intervals and sample power, which is often very poor, generally among scientists. Does the panel have any suggestions about what a priori or post hoc values for confidence intervals of power should be reported and how should ECIs navigate this for new techniques? I'd probably just say before people start answering the questions, I think if you are going to send negative studies our way, uh, and I encourage you to do so, um, actually having some evidence of power in your write-up um, that you have adequate power would be actually very useful and uh, we'd look favorably upon that. So. Does anybody have any comments on this? I mean, David, considering you brought this up, do you think, first of all, possibly, I would ask you, what do you think? Is there an a priori confidence interval or sample power that, that we need to report? Okay, I'm going to be brutally honest here. I think the problem, it comes back to the problem of, of how our experiments start off. In an ideal world, we design the experiment, we do a power calculation or equivalent, and informed by that, we do the study. Now in practice, what happens is we set out to do an experiment. We get some interesting data, but it, it's no use for the particular experiment. It doesn't address the particular experiment we set out to do, but we're creative people and, and we it immediately makes us think of some other experiment to do. Now, technically what we should do then is gather a whole set of new data to validate our new hypothesis. That's what people tell us to do in practice, because that's expensive and because time is short and we want to publish, we don't do that. So this is an incredibly important question, but I think it's wrapped up in lots of other things. And I don't want to sound like a hypocrite, but I have to be honest and say, there's a difference between what I've done over my career and what I now encourage other people to do. And there's at least one of my ex-PhD students I see on the line who will validate that for me. Yes, I think you are absolutely right. And that's one of the key issues in the field. And you may remember, David, that I even asked you recently, because we had a discussion in the faculty, imagine, many professors sitting in a committee, and I asked them, 
is it okay if you if you do a power calculation to do your enamel experiments let's say you and it says you need 12 in each group and you find a positive result after having done five in each group and half of the committee said of course you should stop yeah. because you should save animals and i was so irritated by that that i even asked the david well, whether I'm, I'm i'm right to say that's wrong it is wrong yeah yeah, and Sorry, I, I, I think I, yeah, to add on that, I, I also started off with um, not um, our science, with not correcting for the, the methodological or the biological replicas, right? So that's, I think, what many have done. Uh, so I, I think we, we really have to be keep confirming that we should do better. This is something we can do better. So we really have to train the, young, the, yeah, the future scientists to do it better than we did, than we started off. And uh, and there I'm still struggling also, but it's not a question with the IPS research, right? Like, uh, how, how often do you do replicas there? So it's an evolving field. And I think it's just nice. I think we should have frequent discussions on this to, to make the field better together. Yeah. <laughs> but good po point, Charles. Yeah. Thank you all, shall we move on to the next one? Um, so so we, we got, uh, we got a, a few ECIs asking questions. And uh, so uh, it's about high, uh, publishing high impact factors uh, uh, journals and the, the, the journal, should those high impact journals do something about negative results? Um, the, the other one is asking if I celebrate my negative results, but I can never publish, what do I do with my career? I mean, I, I, I think there's no doubt that a positive result, we all, we've all grown up to find a positive result much more interesting. I mean, so I'm not I'm not talking about a result that disagrees with a previously published publication because that can be very interesting. I'm just saying if if I put a drug on my myocyte and it does nothing, that's in, in one sense an important thing for the world to know, but it's not very interesting. And in, in my editorial, I give the analogy: it's like if you read a detective novel, and at the end of the novel it just says that X didn't commit the murder. You're left wondering who did commit the murder. So that's so. I think people are are less turned on by negative data, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't publish it. Yeah, uh, I put something in the chat in this respect with your snake oil. Like snake um, oil. Uh, because I think one prerequisite to publish or to do accept or to discuss about the negative result is that at least the idea should be good. There should be some kind of a hypothesis well taken, let's say, a reasonable hypothesis based on something. And that actually would create a problem for your snake oil because everybody would say, well, there is nothing. So the nine papers no. would probably no, even not be published in James C. Plus. No, the snake oil is based upon the mesenchymal stem cell thing. So let's, the analogy would be a perfectly proper hypothesis is that mesenchymal stem cells integrate into the failing heart and make it contract more strongly. Yeah, that's so was a hypothesis. My, yeah, fine. So my analogy would be that snake oil makes the failing heart beat more strongly. I don't see almost any difference why, between the two. Why should it do that? Oh, I'm sure I can find something somewhere. Okay, okay. So you would be so clever to find something. Yeah, yeah, people who have been bitten by snakes are less likely to die of heart failure. Ah. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, but do we agree that we need a good hypothesis at least, or somewhat? Uh, I think if you've got it, yes, you need a good hypothesis. If you haven't got a good hypothesis, I wouldn't publish it, but it might be worth recording in a database, just as a piece of phenomenology. And, and the, I would encourage, like, if, I mean, we, we've published methods papers also on the design of optimizing methods, and those were highly cited. So a, a way to also distinguish yourself is have 
hypothesis-based research, but parallel you're working on optimizing your methods, which, which are very welcome to the audience. Yeah. And can be easily published. So I think there would be an advice to distinguish yourself as well as a junior scientist. You can work on, on the parallel aspects and, and I never really encountered huge hurdles to, to publish such uh, advances in, in optimizing techniques. That's, uh... I mean, I guess, you know, I guess probably um, the two questions, Jed by Jessica and Kim, are really referring to high impact factor journals and building careers, uh, which we accept that you need to build your career. Um, you need to publish in these we, I think we generally accept that. I mean, hopefully but that what's accepted... the definition of high impact. Yeah, I, I've been on many panels for for uh, for the, the talent grants in the Netherlands and also abroad. And and at least my my feeling was never also not that maybe some of the, the, the committee members has a strong opinion about high impact, but overall. The consensus was that it was a clear project description with a strong hypothesis and the past track record that there was evidence, expertise, and 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 some evidence of publications. But but to me that never has been a yes or no for granting a person yes or no. So, I mean, I I agree with you in principle, but uh, you know we also would always say. Oh, but it would be great if you had a couple of nature papers. You know, obviously that's going to strengthen your chances. No, no one but would I know many. I don't have one, <laughs> and I know many no, but... <laughs> success stories who do. I definitely don't have such papers. Or, or circulation, or circulation <laughs> research, or PNAS. You know, the, I mean, so yeah. that, I think there's an agreement on that generally. So I guess the question is, um, I mean, you a lot of you sit. Uh, there, you're either editors or you're on editorial boards of actually high impact factor journals. Do you see any movement on this issue? You know, are these journals more likely to accept studies that that are reporting negative data or not? Or you know, I guess that's what the the, the two questions are probably referring to. Um, I, I mean, in the clinical field, it's actually quite common to do so, even at this, let's say circulation level. If the hypothesis was good, is there if there's any basic uh, data, basic uh, science data suggesting an effect of whatever on whatever, and then there's a controlled clinical trial showing nothing, that is published in circulation, for example. Probably not in the New England Journal, but uh, in 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 a good journal like Circulation, it, it is. But it really depends on how good is the evidence, uh, how good is the, the the hypothesis, if this is not convincing, of course, not, that they will not publish it. And I, okay, I doubt about the snake oil. We're, oh. we're approaching the hour. Um, maybe, Davo, you can summarize it up. Uh, yes. I mean, well, first of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers um, and, and all the panelists. Uh, I think this is such an important topic, and it's clear, emphasized by uh, Thomas. Thank you so much. Um, I just saw your text. Um, I, I, you know, I, this is clearly an important topic with lots of questions. Lots of people actually affected by this because their careers are dependent on it to a large extent. And uh, I, I would just say that um, at the JMCC Plus, we we have started this um, open call uh, with this in mind to actually allow publication of such data. And um, and actually to allow quick communication of this work, because we feel it's not only important for for individuals who do this work, but it's in the, it's important for the science as a whole. And uh, and and also it needs to it, to an extent contribute towards prevention of this positive publication bias, which we're experiencing. So I'd encourage all of you who are listening to us, all the panelists as well, um, send in the work. Um, it needs to be robust and like like wrong mentioned um we want to see that, that the science is strong uh your te techniques are strong but actually we're not driven by um impact or or novelty uh here so uh, and we will allow discussions in in sort of in terms of editorials and and um to take place as well as commentary on the papers um that are published so so that's probably what i would say wrong would you like to uh, finalize anything else and and 
send any last words over to everyone. Uh, not, nothing to add. I really enjoyed the webinar. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank, so thank you. Hopefully, we continue the discussion in, 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 at the GMCC Plus. Thank you, everyone. And sorry for the people that we haven't had a chance to address questions. We've had lots of our own questions, which we didn't have a chance to address. Uh, but I think a lot of the questions that came in addressed to an extent uh, the ones that we've had as well. Yolanda, Ron, David, thank you so much for your time. And please read the editorials um, that are written, that are sent in by David, Yolanda and Ron. They're very insightful and I think contribute to this uh, discussion quite a lot. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Are you happy, therefore? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Are we offline me... now? We're not, we're not, we're not. Uh, <laughs> let me stop the recording as well, and we're not. <laughs>